All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the 2023 ASEA Alliance webinar series. Um, thanks for joining us. I just have a few housekeeping things real quick to cover. Um, so my name is Rebecca Lover. I'm the Forest Projects Coordinator with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, and we're happy to have you here today. Um, if you want, you can have your camera on. You're certainly welcome to, um, but please keep yourself muted during the presentation. Um, we'll be collecting questions to answer at the end of the presentation, so you can put those in the chat, um, and then Jenna's going to um, organize those and read them to me once I'm done with the presentation, so we'll an answer those at the end. Um, and then before we get started, I'm just going to do some background introduction on the Alliance and who we are. Um, so we were founded in 1971, um, and we're a nonprofit organization that works to restore the lands and waters of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, so we're really focused on collaboration and an action approach, um, approach uh, action oriented approach that delivers on the ground solutions, um, technical assistance, and also building capacity to achieve healthier lands and cleaner water. Um, so for us, it's all about working upstream to build resilience on the land for long-term improvement to water quality in our communities. Um, and in order to do that, we have four office locations kind of situated around the watershed. Um, our headquarters is in Annapolis, Maryland, but then we also have an office in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is where I'm based out of, um, and then Richmond, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. as well. And then the work that we're doing is also organized into four different categories. Um, so we have our agriculture, forests, um, green infrastructure, and stewardship engagement teams. Um, and we're all working together to kind of use different approaches in order to achieve that restoration work. Um, and I'm coming from the forest team. So that's yeah, the, the part of the organization that I represent as well. Um, and if you're interested in kind of continuing to be involved with the Alliance, we always have lots of, you know, webinars, events, that sort of thing as well. Um, I encourage you to check out our website if you want to get more information on those. We also have this QR code here that you can scan. I'll leave this up for a second here. Um, this takes you to our volunteer page. Um, you can also put that URL in as well. Um, so this will have any of our volunteer opportunities. You know, coming from the forest team, we have lots of volunteer opportunities if you're in Pennsylvania. Um, we'll have plenty of tree plantings this fall that you can join too. Um, so you can check out our volunteer page for all of those opportunities too. Um, and then we're kind of wrapping up the Asset Alliance sessions here. We do have two more coming up. Um, the one next week is DIY Rain Gardens. And then the one following that is about turtles in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, so if you're interested in either of those, you can sign up for those. Um, there'll also be Thursdays at this time as well. Um, so we've got two more remaining of those. Um, so that was all the kind of intro stuff that we wanted to cover. So now I'm going to switch into my presentation. So as I said, my name is Rebecca Lover. I'm the Forest Projects Coordinator based out of our Lancaster, Pennsylvania office. Um, and I'm going to be discussing uh, introduction to macro aquatic macroinvertebrates today. Um, so just real quick before I get into that, I did want to um, just kind of show what my background was so you can all see where I'm coming from with this information. Um, so during college, um, as I was an intern over the, each summer for three summers um, at Stroud Water Research Center um, in their entomology department. So I'm going to be referencing Stroud a lot. They're a really great um, resource for macroinvertebrate information. Um, they also do a lot of great restoration work. Um, we work really closely with them as well. Um, so I'll be plugging them a lot throughout this presentation. Um, but as an intern there, I was basically spending eight hours a day looking through a microscope. So kind of that, that photo on the bottom right there is what I got to see for most of the day, every day. Um, and we were basically um, identifying macroinvertebrates down to the family level, um, which we then used to do some data analysis and a presentation at the end of each summer on um, the water quality on some of the streams that um, the macroinvertebrate samples were pulled from. Um, so that was kind of my professional exposure to uh, macroinvertebrates. And then since then, um, you know, with my current work now, we don't do a ton with macroinvertebrates. I'm focused on reforestation instead. But um, anytime I'm near a stream or anything like that, I try to check out, see what's in the stream, um, but definitely much more recreational focus than work focus. So just wanted to kind of give that caveat that I'm not an expert. Um, I've had, yeah, those three summers of internship experience where I got to do a lot of identification um, and really sparked my interest in macroinvertebrates. But 
again, this is an intro level presentation, so I'll do my best to answer questions, that sort of thing, but uh, mostly just want to give an overview uh, on macro rubrics. So then moving ahead into the, the bulk of the presentation here. Um, so just uh, as background to what benthic aquatic macroinvertebrates are. So breaking down that name, um, benthic just means bottom dwelling. So you're going to find them on the, the bottom of a stream or pond, um, the, the water body that you're looking at. Um, aquatic just means that part of their life cycle is completed in the in the stream or water body. Um, for a lot of these, though, their adult stage um, isn't in the water, but at least a portion of their life cycle is is based in the water. Um, and the ones that I, I'm familiar with, their aquatic stage of life as well. Um, macro just means they're large enough to see without a microscope. So if you're going to identify these down to family level or further, you're, you're going to need a microscope, but you can at least um, see them without one. And then invertebrate just means that they don't have a backbone. So I've got a few examples pictured here. Um, and I also should say there's um, a really great, great website that Stroud put together called macroinvertebrates.org. Um, I'll plug that at the end too, but they have really amazing photos um, that these are taken from. So if, you're, if you want good quality close-up photos, that's a great website to check out. Um, so where do you find these um, macroinvertebrates? So, um, they're pretty much in any water body, um, so like ponds, um, small streams, up to large rivers. Um, those are the areas I'm familiar with in Pennsylvania, kind of the ones that I've worked in. Um, if you're looking for them, you're going to find them attached to rocks or vegetation, woody debris, that sort of thing that's on the bottom of the stream or in the stream bed itself. Um, but what kinds of, what species of um, macrovertebrates you find is going to depend on the water quality. Um, it's going to depend on the type of water body. So ponds are going to have different assemblages than small streams or large rivers would have. Um, the water chemistry is also a major factor. I know limestone streams have different um, species makeups than non-limestone streams. And then time of year is also really important, um, especially for something like a mayfly where they're hatching out you know, in, in May or so. Um, it's uh, Normally sampling occurs in April to kind of catch the, the end of their aquatic stage before they're um, hatching out as adults. Um, and then why do we care about them? Obviously, you all are here because you have some form of interest in them, um, but I just wanted to list out kind of different ways that, or different reasons why um, we kind of pay attention to these organisms. Um, they're really important food source for other organisms or other organisms like fish um, specifically. That bottom right photo there um, is of a fly that um, our communications director had made that's imitating the macroinvertebrate um, pictured with it as well. Um, so if you're a fly fisherman or um, really like to be on the water for um, angling, that sort of thing, um, you know that macroinvertebrates are food source for the fish and that's what we're imitating with those flies. So um, really important part of our food chain or of the, the food chain in the streams. Um, they also help to clean the water. They do help a little bit with processing um, you know, nutrients, that sort of thing that are coming into the water. Um, similarly, they process incoming vegetations, so like all the leaves that are falling into the stream, they're breaking down into smaller sizes so other things can eat them, um, that, that can keep the nutrients cycling throughout the stream. Um, they're really important source of biodiversity. So you can see that top right photo. They're just that's within a small sample. There's you know a bunch of different species of macroinvertebrates shown. Um, there's yeah a really wide diversity of species of macroinvertebrates. So really neat um, if you're if you care about biodiversity, this is a really biodiverse um, group to look at. Um, and also really importantly, they're water quality indicators, and we like to kind of call them the canaries in the coal mine. Um, so when you start to see certain um, families of macroinvertebrates disappearing, that can be an indicator that um, the water quality is decreasing. And I'll talk about that more in depthly um, in a little bit. And also just because I think they're cool. So um, really need to learn like how to identify the species or families and um, kind of their habits, all that sort of thing as well. Um, so a little bit more on their um, habitat. So um, you're going to find macroinvertebrates mostly, mostly in the benthic zone, um, also in the zone that's right below the benthic zone, so kind of uh, the area right into the stream channel itself, um, into the stream bed. Uh, but most, mostly in the benthic zone, if you're flipping over rocks, that sort of thing, you'll be able to find them there. Um, 
is it important to note the difference between riffles versus pools when you're looking for macroinvertebrates? So riffles are areas um, shown in that bottom right photo there where um, you have a lot of oxygen that's entering the stream uh, because of like how the, the boulders and stones, that sort of things are structured um, in the stream. It's creating those riffle areas. Um, these are important for macroinvertebrates because they like areas um, with higher oxygen. So you're more likely to find a little, the more sensitive um, organisms in the in those areas. So if you're out looking around, I always try to check out the riffle um, spots for um, if I'm looking for some of the, the more sensitive species as well. Um, and then substrate is really important when it comes to macroinvertebrate habitat. Um, if you want a diversity of macroinvertebrates, you want a diversity of substrate types. Um, this is also something that people pay attention to when they're doing stream monitoring. Um, it's kind of the different uh, makeup of the, the stream bed. Um, so in that the middle chart there, um, you have like classified woody debris and then different size of rocks from bedrock all the way down to like sand or fine gravel. Um, that photo on the left showing just the different um, size of rocks that you can find. So different organisms are gonna like to be in or be on different um, size rocks, that sort of thing. So having that diversity as well can help um, also promote their habitat too. Um, and on that note of habitat, um, surrounding vegetation for um, the stream is really crucial. Um, on the forest team, myself, um, this is something that we're working directly on is trying to restore our waterways and make sure there's surrounding vegetation for water quality, um, and also for the macroinvertebrates that are in the stream, making sure that they have shade, a food source, um, kind of a healthy waterway to be within. So photo on the left showing, you know, an area that is forested, there's lots of leaf input coming into the stream, um, nice substrate diversity as well, um, versus um, the stream on the right that previously didn't have any forest cover. You can see there's a tree planting that just went in, um, but you know, it's an open, probably the water's gonna be warmer, um, not as much vegetation input, that sort of thing. So not as good of a habitat for these macroinvertebrates to be within. Um, and similarly on that note, just a quick plug for tree plantings. Um, this is a really great way to promote macroinvertebrate habitat is um, trying to get more riparian forest buffers um, is our term for them, but like streamside trees um, implemented uh, to protect our waterways, to cool the water down, uh, make sure there's um, good habitat and leaf input for the macroinvertebrates in our streams. Um, so kind of getting back into the nitty gritty of macroinvertebrates um, for their life cycle, as I mentioned, um, a lot of them will have an adult stage that is outside of the water, but for their immature stages, so if they're a nymph or um, larva pupa stage, they're going to be in the water. Um, so that chart on the bottom kind of shows, illustrates um, two different kind of versions of that, um, complete metamorphosis and then incomplete metamorphosis. Um, so yeah, in their immature stages, they're in the water. Um, for some um, organisms, this can take up to several years. So for um, dragonflies and damselflies, the odonates um, that I've listed there, they're um, in their immature phase for a couple of years before hatching out into the, um, yeah, into their uh, terrestrial stage. Um, and for a lot of organisms, this adult stage is fairly short. It's mostly just for reproduction. So they're, they might, it just might be a few days or a week or so that they're in their adult stage, um, reproduce and then kind of cycle restarts as well. Um, so you might be familiar with mayflies and stoneflies. Um, they're uh, really well known for their like kind of swarms that they form where there's, a, they all hatch at once. Um, and they're all mating at the same time. Um, so yeah, if an evening in May, you can sometimes catch those forms um, out if you're on a, a body of water. Um, something to note is that the coleoptera, which is the beetles, um, a lot of them will stay in the water as adults um, as well. So there's a lot of, just illustrating that there's a lot of variability with their life cycle. Um, but for the most part, immature stage is in the water, adult stage is out of the water. Um, and another important thing to note um, is that water temperature is really crucial when it comes to this life cycle, just because they're using, um, you know, the cues of the water um, temperature to determine when to hatch out. Um, so I know there's a question I'll address later about like how climate change can potentially affect things and 
I don't have, yeah, this I'm not um, a researcher on this, but I and would expect that, um, you know, changing temperatures, that sort of thing is going to also kind of change the timing of when these hatches will occur. Um, so for macroinvertebrate feeding, um, I'd already kind of talked about um, the importance of streamside vegetation, but there's also um, important vegetation in the stream. So things like algae um, or like moss that's growing on the rocks themselves in that bottom middle photo there. Um, that's an important source of food for um, some macrovertebrates. I'll talk about um, those feeding categories on the next slide. Um, but just knowing that, you know, there's some food source that's coming from in-stream and then a lot of food source um, that's coming from outside of the stream. Um, so that's a what's called a leaf pack is shown on the bottom right there. So that's just a, kind of a bundle of leaves that can form. Um, so it's a really great hot spot for macroinvertebrates. Um, they'll be in there eating, breaking down the leaves. Um, yeah, if you kind of can generally sort through one, you can normally find a lot of different macroinvertebrates in there as well. Um, but again, it's showing the importance of having streamside trees and vegetation for those inputs into the stream as well. Um, and then kind of on a secondary level, um, macroinvertebrates are also eating other macros um, or small fish if they're of the predator type. So things like dragonflies, damselflies, um, when they're in their aquatic stage, they're, they're predators. So they're kind of eating, they're not eating um, like the vegetation, they're eating other macroinvertebrates or small fish as well. Um, you know, these, these macroinvertebrates are really important in um, cycling nutrients through the system. So they're, they're the ones breaking down the leaves, making them into smaller particles um, that other things can then eat. Um, and then also providing, um, functioning as a food source too for other organisms as well. Um, so this is a, a really cool thing. So there's a lot of text on this slide, but this is just outlining the different types of feeding groups that macroinvertebrates can be. Um, this is, these categories are sometimes used um, for like um, stream quality analysis. So just seeing the diversity, making um, note of like how many, um, what percentage of different um, feeding groups are represented within a specific stream. Um, so just to kind of run through what these are, the shredder category are the ones that are, um, would be breaking down those leaves that I just mentioned. So they're breaking down coarse particulate organic matter so things like woody debris, leaves, just larger uh, vegetation. They're the ones shredding it, um, eating it, but also making smaller particles. Um, so that would be then um, called fine particulate organic matter, would be the what's broken down from that coarse um, particulate matter as well. Um, and then organisms like collector gatherers are then able to um, eat that um, size material. The collector gatherers are collecting, as the name implies, um, that material off of the stream bed. They're kind of still hunting around looking for it, um, gathering it up, that sort of thing, um, as, as opposed to the, the filter feeders that are collecting and filtering um, the same material, but they're um, gathering stuff that's just floating around in the water column. So some of the macros have kind of like little nets that um, or attached to them that they use to filter out the water. There's lots of different um, kind of mechanisms for which they're, that they use to catch this um, particular matter. But that's another um, feeding category as well. And then um, scraper grazers are ones that are feeding on vegetation that's attached to rocks and woody debris. So um, I had shown that previous slide about um, the in-stream vegetation that's growing. So they'd be feeding on stuff like that, like moss that's growing on the, or algae that's growing on the rocks themselves or scraping that off, um, kind of like the sheep of the, the macro world, if you will. Um, and then the final category is predators. So as I mentioned, um, things like damselflies, dragonflies, um, organisms that are feeding on other non-plant organisms. Um, so if eating smaller macroinvertebrates, sometimes really small fish as well. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, these feeding categories, um, if you're having a wide variety of, like if all these feeding categories are represented, that's normally a good sign that you have a diversity um, of organic matter and substrate on the bottom of the stream bed. So it's a good sign if you have a lot of diversity in these um, feeding categories as well. It shows that you know you kind of have a healthy biodiverse um, stream system that's functioning. 
Um, so as many of you are probably familiar, MEF and rubrics are used um, to indicate water quality. Um, this is for a lot of different reasons. Um, they're really good, as I mentioned, they're kind of the canaries in the coal mine, so they're really good at showing responses to environmental changes. Um, some are more sensitive to pollution than others, so that is really helpful to indicate because if the ones that are pollution sensitive are disappearing and the ones that are tolerant are staying, that probably means that there's something um, negatively impacting the water quality. So the fact that there are so many of them, they kind of occupy a range of different pollution tolerances um, by measuring what's there and what's not there, that can give you a good picture um, of how the stream is doing. Um, another important note about them is that they do have a limited travel range. They're not, you know, they're not traveling miles and miles up and down the stream. They're um, just kind of occupying a more limited range. So um, if you're sampling a specific area repeatedly, um, the organisms that you're pulling from that stream from that sample spot is directly related to how that specific portion of the stream is doing. It's not um, influence those those macro rubrics are directly influenced by that stream in that specific location. So it's really helpful for sampling purposes to have that because um, you know there's not a ton of you know other inputs, other factors um, beyond what that local stream is experiencing. Um, they also show direct reliance on surrounding ecosystem and local water quality. So um, again, by sampling in that specific spot, you're seeing kind of direct cor correlation between um, how the surrounding um, vegetation water quality is doing as well. Um, and they're also really great for sampling because they are so abundant in the stream. So you're able to come back each year and sample at the same location. Um, you're not really too um, hugely impacting the uh, makeup of the macroverbrates in that area. They um, are so you know abundant that they're able to to recover pretty quickly. Um, you're not taking too much each time you're sampling. Um, and then also with this water quality monitoring, you're um, generally most of the the metrics that people are using, you're identifying them down to genus or species level. Um, so on that note, um, that can be really tricky. Uh, I know when I was at Stroud, we were identifying things down to family level, um, and then kind of the, the more experts would take things down to genus and species level. Um, so on the right here, this is um, different genera of the family Heptagenaid, which is a type of mayfly. Um, I know if I was looking at like the top two A and B there, um, I would have a hard time telling those apart um, without, you know, further training, that sort of thing. So just showing that um, this is pretty tricky technical work um, when you're getting to the kind of scientific research level of um, water quality monitoring. Um, just want to point out too, that's really neat that um, how diverse these are and um, there's so many different species within the same family of, um, you know, mayflies or these heptogenates as well. Um, so again, so as I was mentioning, um, I at Stroud was um, identifying things down to the family level. I'm just going to do a quick overview of a few different um, orders of macroinvertebrates. Um, but again, people are identifying these even further down to genus and species when they're using them for um, water quality uh, monitoring purposes. Um, so the first one um, is probably most commonly known as the mayflies um, or ephemeroptera is their scientific name. Um, to identify them, um, they do have six jointed legs. Um, and then something that separates them from stoneflies is that they have three tails generally. There are a few that only will have two tails, um, but for the most part, they have three tails. And then um, if you're looking at them through a microscope, you're able to see this. It's a little tricky if you don't have one, um, but they do have just one claw per foot, whereas the um, stone flies will have two claws per um, each of their feet as well. And then they have abdominal gills. So um, you can see in between there, the on the bottom left there, um, between the mayfly's last set of legs and then its tails, those are the, um, the, the gills that are coming off of its abdomen. Um, so stoneflies won't have those, um, but mayflies will. Um, so that's one way to also distinguish them too. And then they do have wing pads that are um, developing again, right? Kind of at its third set of legs there, you can see the wing pads that are, um, that will eventually be its wings once it's outside of the water as well. Um, so these are really pollution sensitive. Um, so again, they're 
used a lot for um, water quality monitoring purposes. If these aren't present in a stream, it can sometimes indicate that there is a um, that there's poor water um, quality in that area as well. Um, and as I said before, they have a pretty short adult phase. Um, they're mostly in the stream and they hatch for some, for some it's only a few days um, during which they mate and then die. Um, so if you get to see them in their adults um, phase in the swarms, that's pretty neat um, since it generally is fairly short. Um, and then as I said, um, these are the mayflies or plecoptera, um, kind of pretty similar to, to, or sorry, the stoneflies or plecoptera, um, pretty similar to mayflies. Um, they also have six jointed legs, but um, rather than having those three tails, they just have two instead. Um, but they do, again, if you're using a microscope, they do have two claws per foot rather than just one. Um, so it's kind of like a little um, split at the end of their feet. And then they don't have those abdominal gills. So you can see on that photo on the bottom left, um, in between the stoneflies set of hind legs um, and then its tails, there's no gills there. Um, sometimes they'll have them uh, kind of under their armpits on their legs or at their neck, um, but they're not going to be on that abdominal section um, either. Um, and then on the bottom right there is a, a photo of a, the adult stage once they hatch out of the water. Um, these are also really pollution sensitive too. Um, so keep an eye out for these again is um, a good way to see how the stream is doing. Um, similarly to mayflies, they also have a short adult phase too. So they're mostly in the water for um, um, until they hatch out as an adult. And then kind of the final one that's um, normally lumped in with those mayflies and stoneflies is the caddisflies or trichoptera is the scientific name. Um, these look a bit different than those other two. They will sometimes have a portable case, which I'll show in a second, so I'll expand on that in a moment here, um, but they do not have those wing pads that the stoneflies and mayflies did. Um, they do have jointed legs though as well, um, but they do um, look a bit different. They don't have the, the tails that are coming off like the stoneflies and mayflies did. Um, these are generally pollution sensitive too, um, and they have a um, also a, a relatively short adult stage where they're hatching out, um, again, just for mating purposes um, too. So these are um, kind of compared lumped in similarly with the mayflies and stoneflies. Um, they kind of can be referred to as like EPT for the um, scientific names, the first letters of each of the scientific names. So that's an important um, water quality index is the EPT percentage or kind of the makeup of the the portion, the sample that you pulled from the stream too. Um, so like I mentioned, these have, a lot of them have portable cases, not all of them, but a lot of the cast flies will make their own cases. So these are pretty neat. Um, they're specific to each family. So all these different pictures here are um, each different families of caddis flies. So they have their own, they look for their own materials. Um, they kind of build them in unique ways. So the one on the top left there is kind of in like a circular pattern. Most of the times they're kind of in like a sleeping bag format where their heads are popping out of the one end and then they have their um, case behind them. Um, but if you flip over a rock and you see what's pictured on the bottom right of all these little um, cases built, that's you can see that there's a bunch of caddis flies there. Um, and Sherrod has actually done some cool research on just how strong those cases are built. They actually can hold rocks together during like flood events, that sort of thing. Um, there's kind of a, there's obviously a, a max to how much they can withstand, but um, the, the bonds that they make between rocks with these cases is surprisingly strong. So that's kind of a neat um, how they're sort of gluing, gluing the rocks together in the stream bed. Um, but yeah, I just think that these cases are really cool and seeing the, the different materials that they look for and build things out of as well. Um, so another order is Odonata. Um, these are the dragonflies and damselflies. Um, so these also have six jointed legs. Um, they do have wing pads as well, um, but something really unique about them, and I'll again show a photo of this in a second, but they have a really large hinged mouth. Um, so that they use for um, preying on other organisms. And then there isn't any hooks at the end of their um, bodies as well compared to like some of the caddis flies have that. Um, and then they do not have abdominal gills either. 
Um, so on the bottom left is a dragonfly. So that doesn't have the tail filament, um, whereas the damselfly, which is on the um, in the middle there, it does um, those three little tails that are coming off of the back of them. So that's a way to tell them apart. Um, these are also relatively pollution sensitive. They're not lumped in with those three previous orders that I just talked about, but um, can also be a good indicator of water quality too. Um, and then obviously most of you are probably familiar with what dragonflies and damselflies look like, um, but just threw a photo in on the bottom there. Um, that, that's what they look like when they hatch out of the stream as well. Uh, so this is really neat after this presentation, if you want to just look up on YouTube this video, um, I think it's the, the photo on the left there is the is taken from that video, but um, there's a really cool recording of a dragonfly that's um, catching some sort of small prey item, um, but they basically have a hinge jaw that shoots out sort of like a basket. So normally what's shown kind of pointing out is up under their um, head more so, and then it shoots out when they're um, trying to grab something. So I just think this is a really cool uh, mechanism. Um, and yeah, that video is really neat if you want to look it up then as well. Um, and then another order is the diptera or flies. This is a really big order. Um, obviously flies is a very broad category, uh, but there are a lot that have their aquatic, um, aquatic stage as well. Um, so these don't have any jointed legs. Um, they don't have a shell like the like a clam or um, muscle would. And then they do have an apparent head, although it's not always 100% apparent, but they do have a type of head, um, like the one on the right there, the head's kind of tucked into its body. But if you're looking through a microscope, you're able to see it. Um, these are, there's a lot of variety in this um, order. Um, for the most part, they're fairly pollution tolerant. So um, I know in the samples that I was looking through, we had always seen a ton of the uh, midges or chironobids, the ones that are photographed on the bottom left there. Um, they'd kind of be in every single sample. So they don't really care too much about the water quality. They'll kind of exist wherever. Um, but some like crane flies, um, which is, um, a family of the diptera there, um, a bit more sensitive. So there's a lot of variation within this order. It's pretty um, diverse grouping, uh, but just wanted to mention this one as well. Um, and I know when I've been looking in streams, I've found a lot of the tapulids, which is the one on the right there. Those are, if you lift up a rock, normally they're kind of hanging out underneath in the, um, like the silt or the, the stream bed. So that might be one that you see more often. Um, and then I can keep listing these, but I just want to throw some up as honorable mentions, those ones you might um, see while you're looking around. So top left one is a water penny. Um, they'll be stuck onto the back of rocks. Um, yeah, they do look like really tiny little pennies. They're kind of cool. Um, but if you flip them over, you can see they have gills on the bottom. Um, if you look closely, the top middle one is a flatworm or a planarid. Um, yeah, they have two eye spots in the bottom right there of that photo. Um, but they kind of, yeah, move in a, I don't know, yeah, in a worm-like way, I guess, um, but, they're, but they are flat like the name implies. Um, top right is a uh, amphipoda um, or scud. Um, they're also pretty common in pretty much every stream. They don't care too much about um, the water quality as well. Um, bottom left is an isopod. Um, kind of look like the amphipoda, but they're more flattened, whereas the amphipoda amphipoda are um, kind of curved um, as well. And then bottom middle photo is a water riffle beetle. Um, they're ones that their adult stage is also in the water too. Um, they kind of turn into something that looks like your classic stereotypical beetle, um, black beetle. Um, and then bottom right is a helgramite, um, one that you want to avoid getting bitten by for sure, uh, but they do look pretty cool. So I just wanted to Again, there you could keep going on and on um, talking about all the different families and genes um, of these organisms. But um, if you like, you know, looking at photos, seeing different types of macroinvertebrates, I would definitely recommend checking out that macroinvertebrates.org website. It's a really great resource as well. Um, so just kind of summarize all of that up. I know I talked about the different orders of macroinvertebrates, but um, I know whenever I think about them, I'm also thinking about a lot of different things, a lot of the other factors. Um, especially if you're looking to find some of the more pollution sensitive ones. Um, some things that you should keep in mind is the size and type of water body. Um, generally, like the smaller waterways, um, 
really like the first order streams, that sort of thing, you're going to be finding different organisms that like if you're looking in the Susquehanna or like a much larger river system. Um, the temperature of the water is really important. Having cool water um, that has, is higher in oxygen is important for these sensitive um, organisms as well. Um, looking at the surrounding vegetation, is there a riparian forest buffer? Is there leaf input coming into the stream for these organisms to eat? Um, and then the substrate on the bottom of the water body, if it's just, you know, completely covered in silt. I know on some sites um, that don't have um, streamside trees or, um, yeah, there's a lot of sediment coming into the stream that's coating kind of the, the bottom of the stream that's going to not um, be a great habitat for those organisms. Um, the time of year is also important, especially if you're doing sampling. Um, normally that happens in April before a lot of these are hatching out of the stream over the summer. Um, and then, of course, keeping in mind any upstream inputs into the water. Um, that can be point source pollution or non-point source pollution. I'm just thinking of like all the development or agriculture that might be um, factoring into the water quality as well. So um, just wanted to list this out that um, these are definitely not isolated organisms. They're reliant on their local water quality. Um, they can't travel very far. Um, so there's a lot of things that are impacting them as well. Um, so if this is all of interest to you, if you want to kind of go out and look for macros yourself, I know I do this whenever I'm hiking along a stream or anything, um, but if you want to find the ones that are a bit more sensitive, I'd recommend going to a stream that has, you know, good riparian vegetation, um, good diversity of substrate, it's shaded, so generally like streams, small streams within like nature preserves, that sort of thing. Um, generally have good uh, macroinvertebrates, um, unless there's some sort of, you know, other pollution aspect going on there. Um, and while you're there, I'd recommend just flipping over some of the small to medium sized rocks, like the, the one um, that I've pictured here um, was one that I flipped over to find that gets a mayfly there. Um, so rocks of that size or even smaller ones as well will have macroinvertebrates either attached to them or under them. So. The ones under would be those collectors, the ones that are, you know, eating things off of the stream bottom um, or predators. And then if you look on the rocks, definitely don't ignore that. Um, you can find the scrapers or the filter feeders. Um, those caddisfly cases as well will be on there. And definitely look closely. These are going to be small. Um, when you're doing sampling, you just kind of capture whatever's in the in the waterway. But if you're just looking for individual organisms, um, you probably have to look pretty closely at the rock to make sure you don't miss any. Um, sometimes if you just kind of hold it in the water, you can see them moving around, um, which is a good way to, to look for them. Um, and on that note, it's always good to keep these organisms in the water as much as possible. They are sensitive um, and you don't want to you know, kill them in the act of just looking at them. So I try to hold them in the water or like have water in my hand if I'm looking more closely at them, just trying to make sure that you're not harming them. Um, always put things back how you found them. So if I flip a rock over, I'm always going to put it back where it was um, once I'm done, that sort of thing. So trying to minimize your impact um, even while you're looking at these organisms too. And definitely keep an eye out for the sensitive ones that I mentioned. So the stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies. Um, I think it's always really cool to see them just because they are a bit more sensitive to stream quality, to water quality. Um, so I like to, you know, it's always special to see them as well. So keep an eye out for those. Um, I know people are really interested in collecting samples of aquatic macroinvertebrates. Um, if this is something of interest to you, I would definitely reach out to an uh, organization that's already doing it. So a local water quality monitoring group or like a conservation district. Um, I didn't list specifics on here because I know people are probably joining from um, different states, that sort of thing. And I'm just mostly familiar with my region of Pennsylvania, um, but definitely connect with a local organization that's already doing this kind of work is a, a great way to do that. Um, I know the Alliance is just starting to do a little bit of this macro rubric collection. So if you're interested in working with the Alliance on this, you can email Kathleen Anthony. Uh, I put her email in there and we can follow up with that as well um, too, if you're interested in kind of learning more about how the Alliance is tapping into this work, but I definitely recommend just getting connected to um, an organization that's already doing this type of monitoring. Um, and kind of on that note too, uh, if you are collecting 
um, like taking them out of the stream, you do have to have a fishing license and follow all the like proper regulations and stuff. They're not just, I know they are abundant, but they're not just kind of fair game for whoever wants to collect them. So um, definitely follow all the, the local rules, that sort of thing about um, Crackman Rubric collections as well. Um, if you want to continue to just like learn more about these, kind of learn more about their identification, um, as I said, Stroud is a really great resource for this. They have a lot of um, great research publications that um, come out fairly regularly. Um, so I would check out their website. Um, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but the macronverbrates.org is a great website. Um, I have a screenshot of it there in the bottom right. Um, you can just kind of click through the different organisms that shows you how to identify them, what to look for on each one, and they're really, really great photos. Um, there's a companion app to this called Packer, pa Pocket Macros um, that you can have on your phone that also kind of walks you through how to identify them and has really great up-close photos, too. Um, so it's, those are two um, really great resources as well. Um, so I'm just going to quickly touch on some of the questions that had been submitted ahead of time. Um, the first one was, do they have, do macrovertebrates have different levels of sensitivity? And hopefully my presentation answered that, but the answer is yes, um, definitely. That's why uh, we like to use them so much for water quality monitoring. Uh, this chart here, you probably can't see the specifics on, but um, the blue dots are the ones that are sensitive to pollution, red dots are the ones that are not sensitive to pollution. So if you're finding a lot of the ones with the red dots next to it and none of the ones with blue, that's probably an indicator that your stream is polluted. Um, so just kind of seeing the makeup of what's present in the stream um, is helpful to, to determine how the, the stream is doing it as well. Um, the next question, uh, what is the best way for non-scientists to click macroinvertebrates macro to analyze from a stream? Um, so I didn't also just mentioned that on a prior slide, but I would definitely recommend getting connected to a local organization that's already doing this work, um, especially because with this kind of monitoring, you need kind of years of data to show um, changes within the stream. Um, it's not just kind of a one-off thing. There can be a lot of annual variation in what's present. Um, so I would definitely get connected with an organization that's been doing this or is planning to do this for multiple years. Um, it kind of has a system in place as well. Um, as I said before, too, it's really, you need a bit more technical training to kind of identify things down to um, genus or species level as well. So probably you're going to have to partner with a, another organization that's doing the actual um, identification, which is what I was doing at Stroud as well. Um, but if you're not, if you don't want to kind of get connected to an organization that's doing it, you can, like I said, you can just flip over a few rocks just to see what's, what's present in the stream. Um, it just won't be kind of a scientific analysis, but you can at least um, still get to see the macros up close and kind of see um, anecdotally at least how the, the stream is doing. Um, and then two other questions I didn't expand on too much, but um, there was a question about salinity um, during high tides and storm surges. I'm guessing this is kind of a Maryland tidal stream question. And I will say I, my experience is within Pennsylvania um, where we don't have those tidal influences. Um, the only thing I would be able to add to this would be that um, I know Stroud has been doing a lot of research into how road salt is affecting salinity within our local waterways and how that's affecting macroinvertebrates. Um, so they have some good publications on that. I don't specifically know about high tides and storm surges. Um, I know that these organisms are sensitive to salt just based off what Stroud is finding with the road salt aspect. Um, but I, I would wonder if there's organisms that are occupying those areas that would just be more tolerant to salinity. Um, but I don't have a good question for specifically for tidal areas. Um, and then the final submitted question was about um, extreme weather conditions, like things resulting from climate change and how that would affect macroinvertebrate populations. Um, I'd said earlier about how important temperature, water temperature is. Um, for indicators um, for when the macrovertebrates are hatching out of the stream. Um, so, you know, anticipate as things keep warming, um, that's going to influence when they're hatching, kind of change their, um, yeah, their time scale, that sort of thing as well. Um, and then with like extreme weather, like flooding and drought, um, obviously that's a major impact on our streams. Um, if you have a smaller stream that 
prior wasn't drying up, but we are having more droughts and it's drying up that completely removes the macrorubrates habit habitat in that area. Um, so it certainly has a negative impact on it as well. Um, and flooding can kind of wash out um, what's in that area. I know they're pretty, it's pretty amazing how strongly they can hold on to the substrate and that sort of thing um, during flooding. Um, but of course it's just adding extra stress stressors in there um, as well. So I would say it, it definitely, climate change is definitely gonna have an impact on them. I can't speak to all the different ways that it will, uh, but I think that, you know, flooding, droughts, the temperature changes, um, just general like loss of habitat is going to continue to be an issue for these populations as well. Um, so I think that, that's the end of my presentation there. Um, I think maybe there are some questions coming in the chat. I don't know if Jenny want to read those off. I'll do my sure. best. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I've been collecting all the questions that have popped into the chat. Um, if you guys have more, feel free to keep putting them in there. Um, we just, I'll start off with a comment that came from Facebook uh, regarding caddis fly cases. Uh, someone just mentioned that they're so beautiful. They've seen earrings being made out of them, which I thought was pretty unique. Yeah, that's, I've also, yeah, I've seen those as well. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, someone had asked earlier, uh, what happens if you're bitten by Helgramite? From what I've heard, I have personally have not been bitten, so I can't personally speak to it, but I think it just hurts a lot. I don't, and they're not like toxic in any way. Like I don't, you don't have to go like rush to the hospital or anything like that. I think it just really, really hurts. I heard from, I've heard from people that have been bitten and I know it's not a pleasant experience, but not like a, a major health concern, I guess. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, so Rebecca, you shared some online like digital resources, the macroinvertebrates.org and um, the Pocket Macros app. Could you recommend any other type of field guides for anyone interested in helping ID macros? Yes, there are definitely a lot of field guides out there. I, none are coming to mind specifically. Is I can is that something I can follow up with after? Because I know that and I do believe Stroud on their website has some links to. Um, I will warn you that they're very generally very technically heavy, so you might have to do some like upfront research on like what the different body parts are and that sort of thing. But definitely worth it if you're trying to get more specific with um, yeah, like learning how to identify different genera and species of macros. Um, but yeah, there are some very, and like when I was at Stroud, they had um, kind of a pared down version of those guys, but um, there are, are guides out there as well. So yeah, I would definitely, rec I know Stroud has them listed on their website and we can follow up afterwards too with, with what okay. those are. Yeah, if, if you want to share those links with me, I can include them in my email tomorrow with the recording of this. Yeah, sounds good. I'll awesome. So in a, Similar vein, someone had asked a question um, about where they can find the chart that you shared um, showing the pollution sensitivity for different macros. Yeah, I did just kind of find that in a Google search. So I will, I, we, yeah, is that something else we can attach yep. to? Yeah, okay. We'll send lots of follow up <laughs> resources. Great. So someone asked on Facebook, um, what action do you recommend taking? I think this was when you were talking about um, like putting rocks back that you flip. Um, someone asked, what action do you recommend taking if you see a cairn, like stacked rocks near a creek? Uh, should they dismantle them or just leave them alone? Um, and kind of a related question, can you talk to why building cairns in, this, in streams out of stream rocks is a bad idea? Like that was a nice leading question there, but thanks yeah. for that, for those questions. Um, yeah, definitely I would say to uh, disassemble those Karens um, and yeah, in case people aren't familiar with them, it's just kind of like people will sometimes pile, pile up um, rocks, I don't know, for whatever reason. Sometimes they're used to mark hiking trails, but if it's in the stream, then it's probably not for that purpose. Um, but anytime you're kind of removing the rocks that are within the stream, um, that's taking away habitat that the macro rivers could be using. As I said, you know, the substrate is really important for their habitat. Um, so I would definitely 
take them apart, put the rocks back into the stream as well. Um, just, yeah, because it's, it's removing their habitat and not really for any purpose. So um, yeah, knock them down if you can. Great, thanks. So there's another question um, asking if there are any special considerations or resources um, for ponds versus streams regarding macros. Yeah, I would say my experience is definitely stream oriented just because that's what we were sampling with or the samples that we were looking at were all coming from streams. Um, so I'm guessing that there are probably pond specific resources. Again, I don't have any at the tip of my fingers, uh, but I know ponds are generally, they're lower in oxygen, the water's generally warmer. So the organisms that you're seeing in them are different. Even if it is like technically good water quality, it's gonna be different from what you're seeing in a stream. Um, so my guess is that there's probably separate resources for ponds, because um, I think, yeah, a lot of the, the metrics and that sort of thing that we were using to an analyze um, the data we were gathering um, from our samples were specific to, to stream. So, um, but yeah, I don't have any on hand as well. So I can maybe look into that as well. Yeah, no problem. Are there any, uh, when someone's going out and just exploring a stream, are there any invasive species they should look out for as well, like in addition to macros and their flipping rocks or anything like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's definitely a lot of, I can speak a lot more about the, the plants, the vegetation that's um, commonly found in streamside areas that would be good to keep an eye out for. Um, within stream, there are some, I know there's some invasive uh, mussels. I will say I haven't seen as many in this area. Um, and yeah, again, we were focused more so on the, the native species that we're using for our um, water quality purposes. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're out looking around um, and you're interested in the, the plant side of things, um, there are, we do have a lot of invasives that are uh, good to keep an eye out for. Um, Japanese knotweed is one that comes to mind that kind of um, sort of looks like bamboo, but not quite the same, um, kind of a wider leaf as well. Um, Japanese hops too. Um, trying to think of other, and if you're in like a, an area that's generally like, as I was mentioning, like kind of like a nature, pre nature preserve, more shaded, that sort of thing, the, the species that you're finding there are going to look, um, invasive species at least are going to look different than in an area that's not that similar habitat. Um, but yeah, I'm guessing the question was probably asking about in-stream invasives. Um, and yeah, I think there's just a few like mussels that are invasive in this region. So again, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer, but there's probably people in here that might have more knowledge about that if you want to add in or we can yeah follow up again. Great. So a couple last two questions so far. Um, could you just define uh, what you mean by collecting? Uh, does collecting mean taking them away from the stream or just looking at them and putting them back? Yeah, so I think if, if that was in reference to like, you need a license for this, um, that would be when you're like removing them from the stream. Um, and yeah, people can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think if you're just, like I said, like just flipping over a rock, holding it in the water, looking at what's there, um, putting it back, like that's not, I wouldn't consider that collecting. You're leaving it in the stream. Um, you don't need to worry about like getting a license for that sort of stuff. Um, but anytime you're like actively like removing, macros from the stream, not putting them back in, um, you would need the license for that. But you're probably not going to be doing that unless you're some sort of agency organization that's um, kind of removing them to study later. Um, but yeah, if you're just flip out there flipping rocks, you're, you're good to go. Um, just make sure yeah, that you're putting things back and um, not damaging the, the macros while you're doing it. Noted, thanks. Uh, last question that we have, um, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, what kind of pollution macros are sensitive to? And um, you already mentioned it varies by species, but it, are there any 
anything in, in particular like sediment, chemicals, microplastics that are especially, I guess, dangerous for them? Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, when we're kind of looking at stream quality, um, the major things that we're analyzing is the, so the oxygen level. So that is kind of related to the temperature of the stream. Generally, warmer water doesn't hold oxygen as well as cooler water does. So that's why we want to make sure that the, the waterway is shaded, um, especially in smaller order streams. It gets a little tricky, you know, when you're dealing with Susquehanna, you're obviously not going to be able to have the middle shaded, but, you know, and the smaller ones that we're, we're testing um, or that organizations are testing, you want to make sure that the, the water is shaded. So it's looking at solved oxygen content. Um, as far as like the pollutants that they're sensitive to, um, generally we're looking at the nitrogen and phosphorus levels. Um, so those are the major nutrients that um, are being inputted into our streams, um, either from agricultural land or just like residential land, fertilizer, that sort of thing. Um, so they're kind of the two nutrients. And then sediment level is also really important. Um, as I mentioned, if like the, the bottom of the stream is just covered in fine sediment, that's sort of choking out the macros um, on the stream bed. So we want to make sure that there's lots of visible substrate. It's not just like a silty um, stream bottom as well. Um, so as far as like, yeah, the water quality perspective, um, we can dissolve oxygen, the nitrogen, phosphorus levels. Um, salinity is another important thing. Um, yeah, as I said about like the road salt um, is definitely a concern over the winter with um, kind of all the, the salt that gets washed into our streams. If things are too high in salinity, that can be, um, that's not good for the, the macroinvertebrates as well. Um, I know, yeah, microplastics are a concern. I think for looking at like macroinvertebrate um, populations, I don't think they're as much of a concern for them. I think it gets to be a higher concern for like slightly larger organisms that could be eating them, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I don't think that for macros as much that's as prevalent of concern as like the dissolved oxygen. Um, water temperature is another one that's really important too. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones that we're looking at. Yeah, I think that covers it mostly. Obviously, if there's like harsh chemicals, that's going to be a concern, but hopefully, yeah, it's really well known. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. That was our last question. Cool. All right. It sounds like we got a couple of things that I'll follow up with. Um, yeah, information wise, I think it'll be good to share yeah. some more resources with folks. Yep, yep. I'll be sending it, like I mentioned earlier, I'll be sending out the recording for this presentation and a couple of the, the links and resources that we talked about during the Q&A session. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks.